Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. I'm Dave Plummer, a retired operating systems engineer from Microsoft, going back to the MS-DOS and Windows 95 days. Most of my career at Microsoft was spent on the Windows shell team, which means I was one of the folks behind the pieces that you interact with each and every day. The start menu, the desktop, the explorer, task manager, all of those things. Now, I was a shell developer, but I was not a shell designer. I got to play the role of one on TV, as they say, a few times when no one else was available to fill the part, with sometimes infamous results like the Windows format dialog. The only one I'm a little proud of is Task Manager, which I designed the UI for because I started the project independently. In other words, it was an unofficial sort of one-person effort for long enough that by the time it actually mattered, the design was sort of baked in. So if you want to know what my design sensibilities are, take a look at the Windows XP Task Manager. Now let's be kind and call it an eminently practical and efficient user interface. It does a lot of stuff, and I think it does it in a discoverable way, with yet without overwhelming the user on the front page. There were two great sins in the original, though, and both were my fault. The first was that I followed the lead set by some of the other Windows NT desktop utilities, like the clock, that they allowed you to remove the window frame by double-clicking any of the non-client area. Now, in the days of 800 by 600, screen real estate was really valuable, and this allowed you to make, you know, use less of it. But if you accidentally double-clicked without knowing how this worked, your task manager would suddenly look very different. There'd be no menus or help to get you back to normal mode. So it was a precedent that I absolutely should have abandoned instead of following. Now, the other problem was the large seven-segment display that I cooked up for the memory and CPU. I've long held a soft spot for seven-segment LEDs, probably since I first saw them on a pinball machine or my grandfather's calculator back in the 1970s. And thus, I emulated their look and style, which I thought was kind of cool, but it doesn't localize well into Japanese or Arabic, for example. In those days, localization of Windows used to be done separately, like there was an entire team called the NTJ team working on Japanese Windows. It's not like that anymore. Now it's a unified code base, and they've long since abandoned my disco-era display digits. But I am most assuredly not a shell designer, as I said, let alone any kind of artist of any sort. Fortunately, that doesn't cause me any angst because I don't have any pretensions to being one, really. Now, that's not to say that I didn't have opinions on how a user interface should look and work. In the meetings of the 90s, I held them strongly and expressed them vocally, sometimes whether asked or not. I remember one time having an argument with a program manager about some UI issue. They wanted to dumb down a piece of system user interface at the cost of actually removing what I felt was important functionality. As a nerd, I always want all the features and all the options. I do want them well organized and so on, but never taken away for the sake of simplification. I think removing functionality is almost always bad, at least for people like me. So I fought what I thought was a good fight. And when he ultimately dropped the mic on me by pointing out that the design was his job after all, I responded with a considerable flex. Yeah, but I know where the code lives. The clear implication, of course, was that I would just change it back if he prevailed. So yeah, it could be a tough place to work back in the 1990s. And uh, let's just say I'm a lot more self-aware these days. If you want to know why, check out my book in the video description. It's full of stories like that. Sadly, I don't remember who it was now, but I think my favorite PM, Joseph, was probably in the room, and I bet he does. So if you're watching, Joe, you know, let me know where I should send the flowers. In any event, I've long since abandoned any pretension to user interface design when it involves artistic and aesthetic decisions of pretty much any significance. But I still sort of consider myself to be an expert just from hanging around with good designers and watching them work for decades. Now, that doesn't mean I could do what they do, just that I can appreciate it when they've done their job very well. So, to me, a good user interface is like pornography is to the Supreme Court. They can't define it, they just know it when they see it. That's why today, I'm going to take you through a parade of some of the worst user interface designs and, in many cases, real implementations. In the old days, you had to at least write an application to even have a user interface, but the web has now democratized access to bad decisions for everyone. But it wouldn't be fair if I didn't pick on myself a little too, which is why I'm going to show you the worst dialogue I ever put in a Microsoft operating system. I almost guarantee you that you've never seen it before, and trust me, it's one that you never ever want to see for real, because if you do, it's game over. Data loss, shut it down, power off, cats and dogs living together, the works. But more on that later. Now, before we dive into all the cool examples of bad user interface, a quick word about subscribing. I was watching Tecmo on a wonderful YouTube channel that I also support on Patreon, and he pointed out that many of his own viewers, even patrons like myself, never actually subscribe to the channel. After all, YouTube is pretty good about suggesting his other videos once you're in the habit of watching them, so it seems there's really little need. 
If you find yourself in a similar situation where you wind up watching my content but you aren't actually subscribed to the channel, please, please do take a second right now to find that big red subscribe button and click on it to sub to Dave's Garage. Because it really does help my YouTube metrics and exposure and the little dopamine burst that I get when you do it is very much appreciated. And that way, you won't miss it when I go off on some technical tangent that YouTube doesn't immediately recognize as being related. Now, back in bad UI land, most of the others come from submissions collected and organized by a person uh, over at Board Panda. I'd love to say her name, but I can't, so I'm going to put it here. That's right. I even PM'd her on Facebook to ask, is her name pronounced anywhere that I could go and learn it? Because I don't want to massacre it. So yeah, text will have to do for today. Anyway, they showcase a combination of truly horrible real designs from actual websites as well as what ifs composed by sadistic would-be designers. They're sort of intermingled though, so if you want to know the source for a particular example, check the video description for a link to the compilation. We'll start down at the bottom and work our way up to the best of the worst, pausing only to stop at noteworthy ones along the way. And stay tuned after the compilation for the worst of the worst, my own dialogue that I promised you earlier. Here's a hint, it has only one button and it's definitely not okay. Or cancel. Alright, let's drop into the browser now so I can skim through the top contenders in the bad dialogue contest. Alright, here we are. And these are not all winners, so I'm going to just kind of skim through them. I've done a little quick pass, so most of them are actually new to me as we get higher up, but uh, I went through to kind of eliminate some of these, so bear with me as I skim through to show you the better ones. Noop, 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 noop. Oh, there we go. Um, this one's kind of cute. It's a fidget spinner to adjust your system volume. Spin it one way to increase, spin it the other way to decrease. So we took the time to actually write the thing too, which is kind of funny. A slider for entering your phone number. Now, if you can imagine, this is probably one of the top five painful ones in here, kind of like what UI would be like if you were in hell. So it's, it wouldn't work because there's probably, what, 400 pixels tops here on the slider and you've got 10 digits of phone numbers to deal with. So uh, yeah, not going to actually practically work, but it will be enough to drive you crazy if you try. Nope, nope, nope. Now, this one is kind of cute because it looks like it's real, or at least somebody coded the whole thing, because if you click through and it's a Twitter post and it goes to an actual website. So the, the vanity here is that there are three drop downs, each with a thousand and then a thousand and then 10,000 entries in each of these drop downs that you have to sort through in order to find your phone number and compose it. It's something that a real novice web designer might do with a tool, but you would not type in all 10,000 entries, I can assure you that. Now this one I will show you only because I'm obligated as a plumber to show you any plumbing related UI and this is of course a flushing system where the uh, volume builds up and then you flush to drain it and you can double flush in order to mute. It's something all right. Enter your phone number and ASCII values. Now I actually know my phone number and ASCII values. So do you probably because all you have to do is add 48 to each one of your digits because 48 is the offset of zero in the ASCII character set. So if your phone number like mine starts with a three then you would have 51 as your first digit of ASCII for your phone number. Still be a painful way to enter it though. This one is, uh, I don't know what, it's art. Let's, let's call it art. So you use Pac-Man in order to eat all the dots that are not your phone number. So it's kind of like drawing a picture or carving an elephant by removing everything that doesn't look like an elephant. You remove all the dots to leave the digits of your phone number and then it adds it to your number and then you click submit. I don't know what game this is a reference to. Age of Empires, Minecraft, I have no idea. Yeah, I don't game much. I mean, if it's not Geometry Wars or Tempest, I don't get it. Now this actually strikes me as something that you could almost imagine making it in in like NT3.1 from maybe a third party ISV or something on a control panel applet page. But I, th I feel like I've seen horrible stuff like this. I've never seen a hundred radio buttons together, but uh, I can imagine it. I don't think I'd ever do it, but I can imagine it. Tetris, anyone? <laughs> I like that. Click here to generate a phone number. Click here to dial the generated number to check if it's your phone number. This one's kind of interesting in that it seems real. You can click through and it's live on the web. It's not at a United Airlines property right now, but it, it claims to be United Airlines. Whether it ever was and was kind of a tongue-in-cheek thing, I have no idea. It could have been, but uh, I like the little animations. <laughs> So to select your phone number, it starts at 0000, 000, 000, 000, 000 and then it war dials every number possible and asks you if your phone is ringing. Uh, so the volume slowly drifts down and then you have to pump up the jam in order to keep it going. Uh, here we go. The digits rapidly cycle and then you have to click on it and get it quickly enough in order to get your number right. Then if you get any digits wrong, you have to restart. 
game of Snake that you uh, would get more challenging as you add digits, right? So he crashes here, but as you go through and you add digits to your phone number, the snake gets longer each time and gets more and more challenging. Yahtzee! Yahtzee is actually more entertaining than that. It's actually pretty cool for a game that comes with like five or six dice and a cup and some rules. Yeah, good way to spend some time on a rainy time at the cottage or something, I guess. But uh, here we go. How many digits of pie? 3.14159265326. Two, six, three. Gone. Two, six, five. I may not know pi as far as I thought, because it looks like I'm wrong, but... One, four, one, five, nine. Two, six, three, five. I don't know. I'll look it up later. Oh, this is like the horrible data entry thing you can do in the Mercedes S class, I believe, where you can spell numbers and letters out on the uh, console mouse pad thing. Pretty weird. Solve the polynomial for your phone number your phone number in binary. So this is very similar to doing the ASCII and then you convert the ASCII into binary. This is only kind of entertaining to me, especially at the moment, because my daughter for Christmas gave me a card and the card was all in binary and everybody looked at me like, come on, computer boy, read the card aloud. So I was looking at the letters or the you know groups of eight digits and I realized that, well, the first and second and then two of the repeated and I realized, oh, that's like hello probably because I was looking through the digits and I figured out that E was the second letter and so I was sure that it was hello, but then when I went on, I had a space and then C. It's like, hello, C. I'm like, Chris, who is this? Um, Merry Christmas, once I got a little further down, but it took, it took a few minutes. So, reading and writing binary, not trivial. I mean, it is, but not if you haven't done it in a while. This impresses me because somebody either wrote an entire game or modified extensively to get it as a mechanism for setting your phone number by setting the order in which you sync the balls. So this one picks a phone number for you, calls that number, asks you if your phone is ringing, and if not, suggests that you call the phone company and change your phone number to be the number it was trying to call. It would, in theory, work after all. Uh, total Eclipse would be 100%, and then partial eclipse would be, or half eclipse would be 50%, but you would think it would be hard to get close to 100 exactly, right? Do they ever get close to 100? Uh, no, actually, they don't even. Curling for the Canadians and the various Scandinavians, and I don't know what accent this is. Oh, I wish they would have done the animation a little further. I mean, you could actually have the numbers closest to the center reading outwards, and that would be the order in which your phone number was set. Huge opportunity wasted. I don't get this one. You're going to be mad if I don't stop on the Rick Astley one. You're going to think I'm Rick rolling you or something. But we have adjusted volume based on your latitude. I guess that's some inside Rick Astley joke that I don't get. It took me a second for this one too. What's going on? And it's a horizontal slider within the super tall aspect ratio of the volume control. So instead of going up and down, it goes left and right. Dragging dots around to spell your phone number? Not my thing. Now we're talking. It's Space Invaders and Breakout. I'm trying to think if this would always work. Is this guaranteed to always have the number available? Like if you called, or could you lock yourself out? Yeah, you can. You can hide numbers and this may not they would have to generate them accurately, right? You couldn't just randomize all nine digits in there in each row because the number you need they may not be above the one you have to pick in the row below it. So that's my first take anyway. <laughs> Please make a noise as loud as you would like the volume to be. That makes sense. And everybody will know exactly what's coming because you've just screamed in the office if you're going to play loud music. Ah, yes, the window crank. I've got a couple older vehicles myself, a couple 69 Pontiacs, which are both power windows, a uh, 70 GMC, which is crank windows. So the first time my kids ever rode in it, they were always blown away by these crank windows. And I think Ellen does a bit on it. This is probably 10 years old, so I don't even know if it's true anymore. But at that time, still, the universal symbol for rolled on your window was to pull up and do this. But what the hell does that even mean? But I mean, you can't just pull up and go. Maybe people do that now. I have no idea. But this is a window crank for raising and lowering your volume. All right, this I appreciate. Tippy volume control. Like those little games you got as a kid where you like get the ball into the right place. Also known as a ball level, probably. 
Uh, the beauty of this is this is a real user interface, right? This is the rotary dial telephone. This is what we had in my house for my entire life until I moved out in my early 20s because my dad had cerebral palsy and he had become accustomed to dialing with that mechanism and it was easier for him than dealing with the rather sensitive, by comparison, touchpad on a touchstone phone. So we kept that phone as the main house phone. And uh, I had a friend whose dad worked at Sastel, the phone company, and he had a vanity phone number as part of the perk of working there, I guess. And it was like mostly zeros and you just didn't want to call anybody like that because it took so long to dial these huge swaths of zeros. It sounds silly now, but you didn't want to call twice in a row, that's for sure. What's going on here? Let's see. Oh, Angry Birds. Launch the ball and where it lands is your new volume. All right, you ready for number one? Here we go, the number one most annoying user interface example, which is incrementing your phone number starting at zero with a single plus button and a submit button. Is this the worst of the worst? We'll compare it to my own in one moment. Okay, with those out of the way, I can turn my attention to the worst of my own creations. Remember, I've been doing this for a while now, but my worst dialogue comes about from my very first Microsoft product that I worked on, MS-DOS. I was writing Smart Drive 4.0, adding some features like CD-ROM caching and so on. I was working on write back disk caching or some aspect of it when I had to confront the operating system developer's worst nightmare, user data loss. Because there is a rare case where data that you think you've already saved cannot then actually be written out to the disk. Back when most computers still had hard drive lights, even under MS-DOS, it was common to save your work and then wait a few seconds before rebooting or turning off the computer. This was done so that the disk could finish flushing or lazy writing any sectors that were still in the cache, waiting to be saved as it were. If the power went out in those few seconds, you'd lose data just the same, but somehow it's worse when it's the computer's own fault. And that happens when there's a disk right here. You save your work, you get up to leave, and then this dialog pops up in your face. Serious disk error. A serious disk error has occurred while writing to the drive. MS-DOS was unable to finish writing data to the disk. Press retry to try again. And you got a retry button. So what's so insidious about this dialog? Well, primarily the fact that you only get that one option, retry. As far as I know, it's the only dialogue in all of Microsoft systems that leaves you just hanging with a single option. There truly is nothing else that can really be done at this point, but the odds that a retry will ever succeed are infinitesimal, so basically, you're going to spend the rest of your days so hitting retry, or you're going to power cycle the computer and start over, data loss or not. Either way, it's a good time to be looking at a full pass of good old ScanDisk. Now, I don't have any Patreons, and I'm not selling anything. I'm just in this for the subs and likes. So if you enjoyed this episode, I'd be very grateful if you'd consider leaving me one of each before you go. Thanks for joining me out here in the shop today. In the meantime and in between time, I hope to see you next time right here in Dave's Garage. Yahtzee!